Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TeacherCast podcast. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you for making TeacherCast your home for professional development. We have a great show for you today. Today, we're going to be talking all about SEO, search engine optimization, and how you can create an amazing website that is not only attracts other educators to come and find it, but attracts the world's largest educator, Google. We're going to be talking about what it takes to make a great blog, what takes what, what it takes to make a great website, and how you can have those search engine crawlers find you. If you want to get a little nerdy with your stuff, this is a great show for you today. There's, of course, several great ways that you can reach out and be a part of our show each and every week. We love it when you find us on Twitter at TeacherCast. Leave us a voice message over at TeacherCast.net slash voicemail. Email us at feedback at TeacherCast. And please take a moment today and go over to TeacherCast.net slash audio and teachercast.net slash video and subscribe and rate all of our shows. We certainly love it and love getting all of the feedback to you. And this show today is all about feedback. We had a lot of people who had written into us and asked questions like, what is a good blog post? How do you write it? How do you create a title and a description that not only is going to get seen on things like Twitter and Facebook, but really, really get out there and be seen by the search crawlers like Google and Bing and all those other great online locations. I have a treat for you today. My guest is an entrepreneur that created his own SEO company while living in Russia. And he did so with the idea that he just wanted to make a difference in the world. And he certainly did. He's a philanthropist and an inventor. And I want to introduce Mr. Chris Reed from Ardor SEO. Chris, how are you today? Welcome to TeacherCast. Hey, Jeff. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much. Tell the audience, where are we talking to you from today? So I'm coming to you from uh, Phnom Penh in Cambodia, in the heart of Southeast Asia. And you are a guy that has been all over the place. You are originally from Australia, correct? Yeah, I'm originally from Brisbane, Australia, but I, uh, I'm a software engineer and moved to the UK after I finished uh, university and worked in financing and had my soul destroyed and learned all about... <laughs> working in the corporate world. And and how is the corporate world around the world? Do you find that things in the UK are similar to things in Australia, similar to things in Russia, or are we completely different no matter what continent we're on? Uh, well, I mean, really Western Europe and Australia is the only places I've worked in corporate. And yeah, they're pretty much the same. Everyone's dredging going to work in the morning, <laughs> sipping on that coffee and <laughs> taking as many smoke breaks as you can, even if you don't smoke. <laughs> Very, very cool. Um, today, we're going to be talking all about search engine optimization. And really, it comes down to building a mousetrap is kind of how I like to deal with things. Is When you're building a website or a blog, there's two ways that I tend to look at things. Is how do I have my content reach others? And then how do I have others reach my content? Let me ask you the, the obvious first question. For those who are new to this topic, what is is SEO? What is search engine optimization? What does it really mean? Yeah, so it's a broad term that it's a really dynamic industry, right? It changes all the time. Google changes regularly and you, you have to uh, adapt to that. But basically, it's trying to drive traffic to your website through search engines. And Google being the most powerful search engine, no one really cares about the other ones. So it, it, we only ever really speak in, the, in terms of Google. And is this something that you find is easy to pick up? and Or is this something that you really do need to sit down and study how to do SEO the right way? Uh, the basics of it are pretty simple. I mean, Google's not the enemy. They're just trying to find good content and index it and make it available to people. You know, it's pretty simple. But... Now, you, you had just said an important word that you said index. And, and I, you know, I, I, I work a lot with Google. I work a lot with search engines. People say Google is a search engine. People say Google is a search index. Are those two terms the same? Are they different? And what do they mean? Yeah, so Google has these things called spiders or Googlebot, and it crawls the internet. It looks at every website and reads what the content is and determines what it should be about, uh, what the article is about and what terms it can rank for. But uh, one thing to consider is how authoritative your site is, is how much time it'll spend analyzing it. So 
like the BBC, right? It's a really high authority. And, you know, Google's pretty sure that if the BBC write an article, people are going to want to read it. So it'll read the whole article and analyze every bit of the text and rank it for heaps of search terms. Where if you're some crazy guy down the road that no one cares about and you write some crazy article about anything, Google might not even look at it. It might take the title and go, yep, that's cool, and move on. Because it only has so much resources, right? And it needs to continually even go back to old content. You know, it doesn't get to just read a page once. It has to see, has that page changed? Has anything changed? So it tries to spend more time on the more authoritative sites and less time on the less authoritative well, many of our listeners out there are that guy that's down the road. How, how does one gain page rank or gain page trust and go from being that guy down the road with a brand new blog to a trusted resource? So Larry Page, the co-founder of Google, uh, before he came up with his page rank algorithm, all search engines were based on uh, keywords. So if you had, you know, buy iPhone, buy iPhone a million times on your website, you'd rank really well for buy iPhone. But this turned out to not work very well. And Larry Page figured, well, when you write a book, if everyone else references your book, then you must be the authority on that niche, right? And he thought, well, it must be the same with websites. If everyone's linking to your website, then you must be the authority. And that's, that was the basis of the PageRank algorithm. And it still is the basis of Google. And it works really well. So really, to rank, you need links. You need people linking to your content. So you know, we, we try and stick to the 10-90 rule. You know, 10% of your time should be making good, good content. 90% of your time should be getting that out there and people linking to it and reading it and talking about it. You know, if you're making content that no one's listening to, it's like screaming in a forest, you know? Right. And Google sees the same. Why should I bother indexing this? Because no one cares about it. And, and when we're looking at having Google find our websites, are all websites created equally? And when I say that, I mean people are using Wix, WordPress, Squarespace, Google Sites, uh, Weebly. Are all these platforms created equally? Does Google search them all the same? Uh, somewhat and, and no as well. On, on the basis, yes, if you've got a very simple web, website. But, uh, I mean, we find Weebly, it's really hard to... Uh, configure a complex website so we often uh, encourage people to move to wordpress you know it's it gives you so much more options to you know so one thing that's really important when you have a bigger website is to put things into silos and silos are to like categorize your content to make it easy for google to understand what is where and what's important but it's also good for a user i mean google's always just trying to provide a good user experience so a, a easy way to think of it is like if you sold dog food, you know, you'd have your front page, which is about we sell dog food. And then you'd have top silo pages like small dogs, medium dogs and large dogs. And then on the small dogs, you'd have an internal page, which, you know, Chihuahuas, Jack Russell and things like that. And then they link back to the, the category pages and it, it just it makes it really easy to navigate real quick for the Google bot to get through your site and work out what's important. So is it important to have this organized before you start doing your website or do you find that most people kind of start to organize after they've made a dozen or so pieces of content? Yeah, if you don't know where you're going, it's hard to make a plan. So a lot of people, when they're building a website, right, they're not really sure exactly what they're doing or what the end goal is. If you can spend time doing it, then yeah, I'd highly recommend it. Right. Like, a, so we've got a customer who's Australian based, but they're just about to launch in the UK. And so they've got a brand new website. And because they're, you know, they're a business that's been around for years and they already know their products and services, we do what's called an information architecture, which we do full keyword analysis and work out the perfect site structure and then get about building all the pages. And so, you know, it'll be like a 50 page website with heaps of content. But, you know, it, if you're a new business that, is just coming up. It's hard to know what all your products and services and what's inf important is going to be. I, I, I always tell people that when they're starting off with new websites, I, I like to sit them down and we do everything on paper. We figure out what the categories might be. We figure out what the tags might be. We figure out where things can go. I, I love it. Any comments on that? I just find it's easier to do things 
pencil and paper sometimes rather than sitting down in front of WordPress and your mind's kind of blank and all the possibilities are in front of you. How do you suggest uh, people you know, build uh, 100% things? 100% agree. I mean, I'm a trained software engineer and specialized in UI design, and that's exactly what we do. Like, draw out your screens. This button goes to that screen, and yep. then you know that button goes to there. You know, it's, it's just so much nicer. You can go sit in a cafe, have a coffee, yeah. enjoy yourself and draw it, draw it up all out and think about it and then come back and implement it. I, I love the meetings where you sit down and you just bring out a stack of post-it notes and you just start putting them up on a big whiteboard and you figure out where you're, where you're we have a good time with all of this stuff. Um, and the, the beauty with that too, Jeff, though, is you get to think about it twice, right? Yeah. Once when you initially drawing it all out, but then again, when you're putting those plans into the computer, you can see if you've missed anything. You know, I, 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 when I generally when I talk to people about websites, I, I use the term website and then I use the term content management system. And I kind of share the two as being, you know, a content management system is your database. Those are your WordPress, Drupal's, uh, Joomla's, things like that. And then you have your websites, which is mostly based around static pages. How do you share that information if somebody comes to you and says i want to build a website but i really just want to do it for a a basic 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 thing do they need to go into a content management system could they get by with a weebly or a squarespace or something that's not necessarily big bulky and you know spreadsheet like uh, i mean you can you could throw up a html page but it's really hard to manage and really hard to progress with mm-hmm. i mean i I think WordPress is quite simple. It's designed to be, it's, it's free. There's heaps of free themes out there. There's lots of very inexpensive fee, uh, themes that are better. You know, if you, if you're serious about business or serious about what you're doing, then you should even invest in getting it done properly. Like, you know, hire a designer and make it look pretty and spend a couple hundred bucks. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. it's, it's the groundwork on what the foundation of where you're building your business. So I, I you want a strong foundation, right? And I, and I'm glad, it's funny. I'm glad you just said that word. For for many of us, doing the website is your business, and you know I run into a lot of this, and I'm sure you know other people out there who are designing websites. Is somebody says, "I'm starting my own business. I want to do a website. My budget's fifty bucks," or "Could you do this amazing, amazing, huge website? I have like three hundred dollars for you." And you're trying to figure out, okay, there's time involved, there's energy, there's three hundred bucks. There's all of these different things. When we're looking to put a website out there so that way Google can find it, that way other people can find it, are there things that we can do outside of simply just making content? I I know there's something called Google Webmaster Tools, and I know we have some plugins. Uh, could you comment on anything about that of what we should look for or what maybe even what questions we can ask when we want to design a website with ourselves or with somebody else? So Google has two free tools, Google Analytics and Google Webmaster Tools. Both of them, you just uh, authenticate that you own the website. It's pretty simple. Uh, Webmaster Tools lets you know about which pages are indexed, which pages aren't. That's a good way of seeing if you've got rubbish content because if Google's not indexing that content, then, well, it doesn't think anything of it. And with their latest algorithm that just came out last week, it's the Rolling Penguin, uh, they've de-indexed a real lot of the in, of the internet, and because it's like, well, why index all this stuff if no one's looking at it? You know, it takes time to uh, keep up with and you know, let make people uh, build build good quality content. Like we we have a customer who has a massive website. They spend about twenty thousand dollars a month on AdWords a week. Sorry, they spend a real uh, heap and they've built out this massive website with so much thin content, lots of it's duplicated and they've just like, you know, cause they're going for a particular keyword on each page and it's just rubbish and Google penalized them. And, you know, now we're cleaning that up and it's been a whole lot of work because, you know, to start with, there was 107 pages of thin content that we had to remove, you know, and Google's, always been trying to get rid of the rubbish, you know, like it's an algorithm. So it's not, a genius it's it, it is are able to game the system but it's been trying over the years and it's getting better and better at it to stop people gaming the system and you know providing a good user experience 
So you, you just mentioned something that, that I've actually been trying to figure out over the last little bit here. You said Google penalized them. How do you know that and what does that mean? Uh, so if you go into Google Webmaster Tools, they will often tell you if you've been penalized. There's two main types of uh, penalties you can receive. One is a panda, which is about content, about content. If you've got thin content or duplicate content, you can get penalized. Uh, and that's really, really, really difficult to recover from. And the other one is Penguin. So as we spoke about backlinks before, yes, they're really super important and Google knows they're super important. But if you try and manipulate their system by generating backlinks, they may also penalize you. So you do need to be careful. You can't go around making spammy links. Uh, you need to have really credible links. So you know, if, you've, uh, if you're a baker, right, you might have a, a nice article on a, on a guy down the street that sells your bread. He might have a, on his website that, you know, this bread is awesome and a link back to your website. That's cool. But if you were uh, generating all these links, I mean, there's so many different ways to do it, uh, like forum profile links, uh, SAPE links. SAPE links are really uh, naughty. SAPE links are what uh, they're, people have hacked websites but they don't, they don't try and damage the website, but they'll insert a link on it where it's not noticeable. And so you can buy all of these links and they're super cheap and they'll be on the front page of a website where the, you know, the owner won't notice it. And they're really effective too, but you know, it's pretty unethical and, and Google knows that too. Yeah? So just try and st stay on the good side of the, of the, of the force. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. With all that, um, when you're saying things like generate good links, we often talk in the educational world about a, a topic called digital citizenship and, and commenting on each other and and just, you know, being a nice guy out there, saying nice things about other people, going to other people's blogs, writing a comment or so. Does Google rank you higher if you're out there in the community commenting, building those links on your own or is there another reason why we should be out there commenting on blogs and, you know, being a part of the, uh, the overall educational community out there? So like there's another type of link that's called a no follow link. So Google decided a couple of years ago that if you've got a paid link on your website, like if someone's doing an ad or something, you're meant to put no follow on it so that it won't pass any authority over because it's a paid link. And so if you look at uh, sites like Huffington Post, the articles, the links inside the articles, they are, are do follow links. So they pass through authority, but the, uh, the links in the comments don't. So there's no real value in commenting on Huffington Post with a link. And that's also to stop people just spamming comments to get links. But, uh, you know, one of my friends who is, he sells websites, empireflippers.com, uh, if you look at their anchor text cloud, how much anchor text comes to them, Justin, his name is really prevalent because he's so out there in the community. You know, people ask questions. Oh, how do I sell my website? And he'll answer them with a nice question and link back to his website. You know, he's providing useful information and the links that he's generating are not really great links. They're not going to help him rank very well, but it's still building the brand and, building his name and you're, you're providing really useful information. So, you know, it's, it's got another benefit. I, I, I think the idea of going out there and, and not only, you know, commenting on other websites for the fact of commenting, but really joining that community. I know the last couple of years, I've really tried to reach out into the world WordPress community and, and dive into different websites and communities and, and meet people and, and make acquaintances. And you know, I guess I'm, partially kind of doing that to get guests on the show and to kind of get some interest in, in what we're doing here. But it's a great way to reach out and to learn things and to knowledge things. If a teacher is looking to learn more about SEO and search engine and building websites, what resources do you recommend they go to? What's, what's your go-to for, uh, for, for search knowledge? Yeah, it's a, see, that's really difficult. It's, it's a big game and it's hard to know what level you're at. Uh, Let's talk basic so, here. Yeah, so I mean, like Ahrefs has got some cool linking stuff. I mean, uh, Moz does some great stuff. Moz is Whiteboard Friday, but uh, so they do a really interesting video every Friday on search and 
the state of the SERPs, they call it, mm -hmm. uh, which is the search engine result page. Uh, for basic stuff, I mean, we've got an authority guide that we put together with a whole bunch of SEOs. You can get that uh, at artorseo.com slash authority guide. And we have uh, guest SEOs that write different articles each week. So that's that tends to be not too technical. So, okay. you know, beginners can get some good information there. Very cool. We're talking today to Chris Reed, uh, entrepreneur and also uh, CEO of a great company called Ardor SEO. That's A-R-D-O-R-S-E-O. -R -R -E and uh, Chris, at the end of this podcast, we're going to be giving away something special from your company. Tell us a little bit about the, uh, the, 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 the SEO package here and, and how can somebody apply for that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, as a little thank you, Jeff, for having me on your show, uh, we put together a competition. And so this competition is to win a, a comprehensive SEO audit that looks at every one of the 200 uh, bits that uh, Google uses to determine where your website should rank. So that's uh, your backlinks, your inbound links, your outbound links. Uh, it looks at your content, your metadata, your page speed, your mobile friendliness, responsiveness, click-through rates, bounce rates, absolutely everything that Google looks at. And so, you know, this is a huge piece of work, comes out to about 80 pages of data about, you know, everything you need to work on on your website. And it's a, you know, $2,000 price tag. So uh, to win the competition, all you need to do is go to Ardor SEO, A-R-D-O-R SEO.com slash teachercast. And uh, is there a deadline that you want to put on that? Uh, yeah, so we'll uh, announce the winner uh, 30 days after after the show airs. All right, so as many people as you can, go to ardorseo, A-R-D-O-S-E-O dot com slash TeacherCast, and I guess at some point you will announce that there is a winner. And yeah, yeah. That's, we'll, awesome. we'll, that's we'll an awesome you know, package. Jeff, you, you, can, you can announce the winner. That is fantastic. Guys, definitely do that, um, you know. It, many of you guys are out there dabbling in WordPress for the first time and starting your blogs. And, and I know a lot of people write into the show over at feedback at teachercast.net and they say, what can I do to make my content stand out? Chris, I'm asking you, what can we do to make our content stand out? If I want to write a blog on being a good baker, what does that look like? What does the title look like? What, what's the difference between an H1 and an H2 and a paragraph tag? And give us the, the, the basic... EDU rundown here of what, what makes a good blog post? Well, what I'd do first is do the keyword research to see what's interesting. So, you know, we're in Cambodia right now with our office and we're often looking for staff because we're growing at a great rate and we need great staff. And generally, if, if you're smart and have good linguistic skills, we can teach you the rest you need to know. And so lots of people... Uh, come to teach English in Southeast Asia. And there's heaps of search volume for teach English in Southeast Asia. And we've recently got this new content guy who's amazing. He's so funny. And he uh, he was telling me about when he came to Cambodia to teach English and how terrible it was and that he you know quickly applied for a content job. <laughs> and so he wrote this awesome article about why not to teach English in Cambodia. So then everyone that's you know, searching for teach English can see our, our post and go, damn, that's a, a way better option. And so, you know, we're, we're now getting traffic off, uh, off a keyword that's not really even related to us, you know? That's pretty cool. When, when, when we're looking to sit down and write that, oh, by the way, I know you had said do some keyword research. Where mm -hmm. do we go to find that information? Where, where do we go to do keyword research? Uh, so if you go to adwords.google.com, mm -hmm. That's a, so AdWords is the paid search that the, the ads that Google has. And so to be able to use those ads, they have to give you information about search traffic and search volume. So you can use that tool and you can add, you can type in anything, you know, a blue iPhone case, case and it'll tell you how many people search for it. And you can minimize it down to just in San Francisco or a whole state or a whole country. We will definitely so have – we're going to have all the links to this stuff on our show notes page as we go through here. This is definitely an, up, an episode. We're going to go back and make sure that all the links are here. So we have our keywords. We have things. What makes a good title? I, I tend as an educator to write things as learn how to use an iPad, and that's asking a question so somebody wants to come and find the answer out. Uh, what, are, what are your strategies for doing titles? With the keyword – 
whatever keyword you're targeting, it's best to have it on the left side, as closest to the left side of the sentence, the better. Okay. So if you if you like, so our guy that wrote that article, he wrote why not to teach English in Cambodia, and I said restructure it so it's teach English in Cambodia, and then the the don't do it, or I'm not sure what he changed it to, but something. Uh, so ideally you keep it on the left-hand side, but you really want to have something that's interesting that gets good click-through rate. So with the, the top 10 on the Google search, the number one gets about 33% of the traffic. Number two gets about 28. And so if you've got a really catchy title that in, introduces people to click on it, and then you have good content and they stay, if you can up that, that towards like 29, 30% of the traffic, it'll eventually switch over and you'll take the number one spot. So it is really important to get good click-through rates. So you have you know, a catchy title that that's interesting. Whatever you're writing about that someone goes, oh, wow, I want to click on that rather than, you know, boring, boring just product description or something. And when we're looking at those keywords, is it interesting to put a generic word or are we looking for a specific? Can we put the word language or do we have to say English language? Uh, well, another thing to think about with keywords too is you might find one that you really like, but if there's heaps of search volume, it's probably competitive, you know, because everything that's valuable, other people are targeting, right? And so just go and search the top 10, you know, type that keyword into Google yourself mm -hmm. and see what the search results are. Do you have a chance of beating any of those guys? If, you know, if it comes up with it's, you know, Best Buy and Amazon and, you know, all these big brands, then you, you, you're going to be in for a tough ride. And if your web, website's really small, then you might want to start off with something a bit simpler. Mm -hmm. How, so, yeah. What if your keyword can mean multiple things? For instance, if you're saying the word Yankees, how does Google know that you're looking for the baseball team or the, you know, Revolutionary War type Yankees? Uh, they they don't always. And in fact, a, a guy wrote a really funny article about this recently. He had an article called uh, how to get high page rank backlinks and it ranked <laughs> for the keyword how to get high. And you know, that's people that are certainly not looking for SEO advice, but looking for a good time. But uh, so Google tracks a bounce rate, right? So people who click on his article and then quickly come back to Google because it's not at all what they're looking for. And Google really rapidly goes, Oh, that's not, that's not the intention of this user. So downgraded, downgraded, and it wasn't ranked for that in no time. And, and is that something that he found out in webmaster tools that this, this particular post was being bounced high because they were thinking it was something else or is that just so, yeah, so, analytics? So the, or? the keyword to uh, the, the keyword search volume on how to get high is really very high. And so he saw in analytics that he got a giant spike in traffic and then, you know, started tracking that keyword and he could see really quick, really rapidly that it, it dropped down, you know, uh, after the, you know, a couple of days it was page two and then dropped right out of the top 100. That That's a great story. <laughs> that's, that's, that, that is absolutely a, a great story. Um, you know, I, I want to switch over here and talk a little bit about WordPress because, again, people here are listening because they want to build their website. Um, I use a plugin called Yoast SEO. I, I think it's fantastic. I'm one of those guys that has subscribed uh, for the last couple years to the, the pro version of that because I really think it helps. It walks you through. It, it has a lot of great tools. Is that a plugin that you recommend? Are there other great SEO plugins out there? Uh, what advice do you have for somebody starting their first WordPress blog and maybe not sure even where to start with all this. Uh, Yoast is certainly a good plugin. It, it helps set up your yeah, metadata, which is important. Like metadata means your description and your title tag. It just helps Google determine what your page is about. So it'll be what, if you've done a good job, it'll be what's dis displayed in the SERP, the search engine result, result page. You know, if, if your page is about, you know, donuts and you put in your title tag, something about hot dogs and Google's not going to believe you and they won't show it. They'll just grab some text from, from your uh, page and try and work out what it's about, or they won't rank it at all because, you know, you've done something bad. But uh, if, if you, if they believe that what you've put in the title is what the post's about, then they'll show you a title. So it's, it's much better if you can put it there. 
Uh, and the description again, you can make something that's interesting rather than Google just pick a random sentence on your on your site. You know, it's going to help get a better click through rate. I've I've been told that your title in Yoast and your URL slug and your description all need to have the same title or same character of words back and forth. What's your advice on that? And and is that something we should be worried about or not worried about at all? Yeah, I mean, if you've got so like I, like I said before, where if your keywords to the left hand side of your title, well, it's the same as in your URL. If it's to the left hand side, if your domain name is the keyword, if you've got an exact match domain name, that's a really good sign, right? Google loves that. Uh, then if it's not the domain name, if it's afterwards, if it's the directory, then if it's the end page, the further to the right hand side, the keyword is the less power it has in the URL. And mm -hmm. the same title and description and, you know, same in your H1 tags. Uh, but one thing to consider too is that you might want to target multiple keywords for one page. Like, and sometimes things are, are uh, synonyms. So like men's fashion and men's clothing, they're like the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you'd, you'd want to kind of put both those keywords on your page. Very, very good advice. Talking here to Chris Reed from Ardor SEO. That's A R D O S E O dot com. Chris, I want to ask you two last things here. Your your Twitter handle happens to be. Can I bring this up here? Cool. You, you, you are at coolest guy in SEO. Is there a story behind that, or you were just bored one night? <laughs> uh, turned out that one of our one of our customers in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, was just paying me out one day, and so. Yeah, that's stuck. <laughs> I love it. And, and and again, all the all the links and stuff here are in our show notes, but you know, definitely cr check Chris out here on LinkedIn. He's 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 linkedin.com slash in slash coolest guy in SEO. Is that SEO friendly to have that there, or should we be having LinkedIn.com slash in slash Chris? I I mean you Google coolest guy in SEO and yeah, I own the top ten, so it's <laughs> works for me. I, I love that. And, and, you know, getting back to the educational thing here, it, it is all about branding. You know, I, I, I work with, you know, school districts. I work with teachers. I, I, I get a chance to really dive in there. And when kids are looking at building their brand, I mean, I, I just say, look, search for Jeff Bradbury. There's a lot of them. I say search for teacher cast. I'm like the first three pages because everything is just branded under one thing. What advice do you have for anybody that's trying to create a brand? And that could go from the 12 year old who wants to try to make it to the 30 year old who's sitting here going, all right, I've been teaching for 20 years. I want to try something. Talk to us about branding and the importance of keeping, you know, universal keywords, universal domain names, all of that stuff. How does that work in search engine optimization? Yeah. Well, like, uh, so we do a lot of sales speaking to people and well when i when i used to do it i'd make sure that you know my my email and my linkedin my twitter all have the same picture as people recognize a face i still do today like if i get an email from someone i go i rec recognize that face haven't don't recognize the name and then i'll search and go yeah i spoke to them two or three years ago you know it's it's branding it's if people recognize the name of the company that's great too you know that takes a that's a bit harder because our brains are you know, geared to recognize people's faces. But uh, yeah, if you can build up your brand, uh, keep your YouTube channel and Facebook page and everything the same name, that's great. And uh, so that's also uh, online reputation management. So there's some nasty people on the internet and, you know, they can come out and attack you and make terrible things about you. And if you've already gone out and made all of the social media or LinkedIn and stuff like that, that, that ranks really well, you know, if that's already been sitting there for a year or two, then if someone does make something nasty about you, it's very hard for it to come and rank over the top. So it's good to get that and protect your brand. Chris, I got to say, thank you so much for your time today. And thank you for the masterclass on all of this stuff. I, I know yeah. I'm going to be certainly listening to this show tomorrow morning and probably every morning for the next couple of weeks as I go through here. What kind of things should we be looking at as we build our sites here? I mean, OK, we talked about blog posts. We talked about plugins. But what are your top two or three don't do this type of advice things? 
I think that the most to-do thing is to think about what the intention is. And this is what a lot of people miss. Now, years ago when I was first in the, the digital marketing world, people were like, oh, I've got a website. Yeah, great. Uh, it ranks for my, word, my, my brand name. Yeah, cool. They, you know, and then I had to teach them about keywords. You actually need to rank for a keyword, not your brand name. And that's cool. And people seem to understand that now. But now it's about what do you do? You've got this traffic to your website. What's the point of it? You just wrote this great article about how to you know, walk a dog. Well, what was the point of it? What did you want to achieve from that? Uh, do you want them to join your mailing list or give you a call or buy a dog leash? You know, like, what are you trying to do? And that that's, seems to be a big part that people are missing. You, you need to find the intention. You've got, the, you've got these people to your site. Now, keep them there. That is some great advice right there. Keep them there. Figure out what to do. That whole call to action. Make sure that you know what you're going for. Um, Chris, thank you so much for all the help that you've done here. Uh, where can people find the coolest guy in SEO uh, if we have any questions? Well, you can uh, Google coolest guy in SEO and you'll find plenty of ways to contact me there. Or you can uh, get me on email. My name's Chris Reed, Chris with a K, K-R-I-S at ardorseo.com, A-R-D-O-R-S-E-O.com. Chris, thank you so much for your time today. And please, you are more than welcome back to come on. Maybe we can do a show with you and a few other teachers, do a little Q&A together here. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on, man. Cheers, Jeff. Been a pleasure. And thank you so much for listening to this amazing masterclass in search engine optimization, web development, all of this stuff. I hope that you have a chance to, uh, to write any of this down. Of course, all of our show notes are going to be over on TeacherCast.net, where you can find us on TeacherCast at TeacherCast. Leave us a voicemail over at TeacherCast.net slash voicemail. Email us at feedback at TeacherCast.net. And of course, subscribe to this and all of our shows over at TeacherCast.net slash audio and TeacherCast.net slash video. On behalf of everybody here on the TeacherCast Education Broadcasting Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury saying take care of the great things in your classroom and continue sharing your passions with your students.